Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to another of our virtual episodes of Faith Matters. Faith Matters, if you're new to uh, our live streams, uh, new to our church family, is an opportunity for us to engage in a conversation about this morning's gospel passage. Um, I joke that the, the sermon is a monologue. I talk, you listen, that's a monologue. A, a dialogue, though, is what we strive for at Faith Matters. It's a conversation about what went on in the gospel, what did you hear, what did you feel? Was something a little new? Was something a little different? Did something kind of jar you and rub you the wrong way, perhaps? And we converse about that. Now, given the current reality of the, the virus world that we're living in, we converse with our cell phones. So what you do is you, you make comments, and then I will look at the comments and I'll try to sort of narrate for everybody what's going on. As soon as I can log into our feed here. There we go, got it, okay. Well, I see that we have Carol and Kelly, Bill and Chris, hello Sharon. There's a there's another guy over here you might want to say hi to. Hello. The power of technology, right? Mary's on Good there. Camera work there right? Great camera work. I know. I'm. Uh, we're getting so good at this technology stuff. It's it's kind of frightening. Hello, Sandy. Okay, my friends. Well, let's give this. Uh, about a 30, 40 seconds or so for people to, to log into it. Um, for those of you who are here, I will give you a little bit of a uh, preview of coming attractions. I am gonna talk later on about uh, a drive-in worship service and don't tell anybody, but yes, we are gonna have a drive-in service next Sunday. Yay. More details to follow on that. All right, folks are starting to log back in here. California is in the house, that is great. Okay, I'm seeing our numbers starting to go up. In the interest of, uh, of time then, let's, let's press on with our gospel passage this morning. This morning we are we're still in the Easter season. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter. Um, and this morning we are in John's gospel. So let me give you the gospel from John. Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hears his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Hmm. 
So, what did you hear? What attracted you? What challenged you? What might have repelled you? I always have been waiting for people to brew on it since I've had the opportunity to read this five days earlier and brew on it all week. Um, I always find it pretty shocking when he says, all who came before me. It's hard for me to imagine who, to whom is Jesus referring, do you think, Father? Because mm -hmm. it seems like a little bit of a, almost a swipe against the prophets, not to answer my own question, but that's what I bump on. Yeah. Are, is he saying, I mean, is this to almost suggest that Jesus is now not only the best standard, but the only? That's an interesting question. Um... I think the answer that comes to me immediately is no, because Jesus spends a lot of time in his ministry saying, I came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And in fact, the prophets are the ones who foretell of the coming of the Messiah, and Jesus, of course, is the realization of those prophecies. But the writer John seems to be a little bit uh, diluting of this well-known message from the synoptics. I... And that he puts these words in Jesus' mouth. Jesus claims that he's the only... Yep. He's not just butter or chocolate chips. He's the whole brownie. <laughs> <laughs> and there's your analogy for the morning, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, well, we also have that same kind of challenge with... The other passage where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Yeah, and Ooh, me that's alone. A, that's a tough one too, right? We hear a lot of things from Jesus. And as Father Chris says, we hear words ascribed to Jesus by the gospel authors. Uh, but that's when you get into the whole concept of textual criticism and... Do the synoptics and John have agreement on the particular stories that we're looking at? And what that means is, you know, there are some stories that run through all four Gospels. Those ones, scholars uh, are very certain, did in fact take place. There are minor differences between the Gospel writers, but those four really did take place. Now, if that same story is in three out of the four, well, that means it probably did take place um, because, hey, that's, that's, that's pretty good agreement. If it's only in two of the Gospels, well, that might be a little bit more. Doesn't mean it didn't happen because each of the Gospel writers has got a particular bent, a particular audience, and a particular story they're trying to tell. Um, but when you get down to one Gospel and only one gospel talking about that story, then it's a little bit more... It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Please make sure you understand and hear me clearly. doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, but you wonder a little bit more about that story. You know, if it did indeed happen, why was it important for that gospel author but not the others? Um, the story from, I think it was just last week, of uh, um, Legion, the Gerasene demoniac, and Jesus casting the hundreds of demons out of, of legion and putting them into the swine and then the swine jumping in the lake and killing themselves, that only happens in one of the Gospels. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it means it was only important to that particular Gospel author. Anyway, let's get back to what some of the folks have been saying here. Uh, but, but, but. Mary tells us that his voice is key to peace and joy. Oh, I like that. I like that a lot. He goes ahead of them. He demonstrates the way and makes sure all their needs are provided for in advance. Well, he leads them to those good pastors, doesn't he? And that's one of the interesting things. He takes them from a place where they're safe and where they're probably being well-fed and leads them out somewhere that they don't even know where they're going. They have to take a leap of faith and follow their shepherd. But because they know, they know his voice, they know that their shepherd loves them and cares for them, they go and they follow. And then their needs are indeed provided for. 
Carol tells us, Father Chris, perhaps he's referring to false leaders and false prophets. Good point. Carolyn says you're making her hungry, so cut it out. <laughs> there are no brownies here, folks. F full disclosure. Nothing on the table with us. What else? I'll tell you one of the things that I sort of caught this time, which I hadn't in prior incarnations, was the other actor in this story. Did anybody pick up on the second actor in the story? I'll give you a minute to respond. The shepherd is not the only person in this story. This is riveting television right now, I know. That is one of our challenges. One of the things we will talk about in this morning's sermon is how um, we train to be priests and in fact we have turned into television and media producers, which is a little bit of a bridge too far, but we're making it work somehow. Yes, Mary. Mary Nicholson, well done. The gatekeeper. I had never picked up on there being a gatekeeper before. I guess I always assumed that the sheep were just in some pasture somewhere and then Jesus the Good Shepherd came and called them out. But no, they're actually sort of penned up and they're behind a fence and there is a gate in the fence and there is a person whose job it is to be the keeper of the gate. So we must be in a situation where there is, the, first of all, let's go back to the ancient world. Sheep, cattle, livestock, anything that you had, this was wealth. This was food, this was clothing, this, this was, you didn't have a 401k, you didn't have an ATM card, you didn't keep your money in the bank, this was your wealth. So you wanted to make sure that your animals were well protected because they cared for, they, they were, you cared for them, and then they in turn cared for you. So we have a situation where these animals, these sheep, are, are sort of enclosed in a pen, and there is a gatekeeper whose job it is to make sure no one goes in or out of that gate, either sheep or person, who doesn't belong. But in addition to the sheep knowing the shepherd, the gatekeeper also knows the shepherd. Can anybody think of who a gatekeeper might have been in the Gospels? I don't know, it always, it, it, as I'm pondering this, and I'm really picking this up for the first time this morning as well, my friends, I'm sort of wondering if that gatekeeper could really be John the Baptist whose job it was to prepare the way for the Messiah. The gatekeeper's job isn't to lead the sheep, it's just to make sure that the sheep are ready and protected for when the shepherd really arrives. Maybe that's just me, what do I know? Rosalie hates being compared to sheep who are the dumbest animals in the kingdom. Well, Certainly not you, Rosalie, but for me, it's a very apt analogy because I am uh, decidedly not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. So I guess I get a little comfort being thought of as one of the sheep. Rosalie, would you be more or less insulted to be compared to a goat? We'll find out. <laughs> Just curious. What animal would you like, Rosalie? Since sheep and goat are so often mentioned in the same phrase in the Bible. That's true. Although you have to be a little bit careful because when, when Jesus comes and separates the sheep and the goats, the sheep go to the good place, the goats, not so much. 
Kelly wonders, could Jesus be the shepherd here on earth, but the gatekeeper where heaven and the Trinity are concerned? It's a nice wonderment. Yeah. We always have that image of St. Paul at the pearly gates, right? With his, uh, his big book. No, it's Peter. Peter? I think. See? We're already, we're already up down the rabbit hole. Who's the gatekeeper there? Gatekeeper keeps people out that I don't like. <laughs> okay, well, that, that's only if we get to be the arbiter of, of who's in and who's out, Joyce. <laughs> oh, that's a really good point. Cindy kind of pushes back on Rosalie's thing and says, if sheep were considered wealth, then we are indeed given value. I like that. Me too. Rosalie wants to be a horse because it's more dignified. <laughs> I don't know, I'll tell you, Rosalie, my wife owns a horse, and uh, I've been up at the barn. There's not a lot of dignity there. I heard a story once where when Catherine Jefford Shorey was the presiding bishop, that there was a sort of a heated theological debate, and someone was being a gatekeeper, and quoted sheep and goats and how the goats were going to be sent to hell and the sheep are loved and embraced by God into all eternity. And after an appropriate pause, the presiding bishop, Jefford Shorey, said, Oh, I don't know. I kind of like goats. <laughs> Catherine had a good way of doing that. And, and in a very warm way brought everybody back into a communicating conversation because it was starting to head toward divisive, uh, preformed opinions. And so I just thought I'd share that story. There you go. Gary wonders, is the gatekeeper the prophets that point to the coming? Was not the prophets the ones quoted by priests as being the law, and was Jesus saying he is the law? That's interesting. It's a good question. Yeah. I like that. Joyce, I was just having a little fun with your comment. Please don't take offense. This is the hard part of reading things as opposed to speaking. Carol says, huh, what about our gated communities that keep out everybody, including our friends? We did have that experience. Um, on Easter Sunday, you probably know that uh, Chris and Sharon went one direction and Jen and I went the other and we took all of the Easter flowers and delivered them to various parishioners around the valley. Um, there were a couple of instances where we couldn't deliver to people we were intending to because they live in gated communities and we didn't have the gate code and couldn't get them on the phone. So, yeah, sometimes those gated communities, while they're meant to keep the sheep in, they keep us out. And flowers. And flowers. And those were some really nice flowers, by the way. Yeah, and Joyce is right on that, that same thing. She doesn't like the gatekeeper keeping people out. But the problem, though, is we want to keep out the people who intend harm to the sheep. I mean, Jesus talks about the thieves and the bandits who come in to kill and to destroy and to steal. Clearly, the gatekeeper wants to keep them out because we don't want someone going in and stealing and, and destroying God's people. So there is some value, I, I think, to the gatekeeper, or am I wrong? Wouldn't be the first time. Just ask my wife. If I'm wrong, tell me. Sheep are humble and innocent. <laughs> Leave it to Dina. She says, but Jesus gives us the gate code. <laughs> I like that. I do like that. Um, Rick, I don't know if this is going to be interesting to everybody, but it might be really interesting to a couple, as it was to me. But I, somewhere along the way, I remember hearing that the gate was very, very, very likely far taller than the pen area around it. Which is an interesting visual for most people that picture farms in the United States of America. That's not the case. 
the gate and the walls are all the same height. But that what was likely the case is it wasn't wood and it wasn't cyclone fencing, of course, but because wood was shorter there and valuable stuff, and what they would do was get brambles or thorns, maybe the same exact thing, incidentally, that became the thorn of crown, uh, the crown of thorns for Jesus. They had huge piles of that, and they would just put a circle, and the gate would then be made of wood and just sort of randomly put in to this circle this pile of thorns and brambles. And on both sides, because the thing to attack the sheep, the wolves, would come over there, and they would see that even though they could easily clear a six-foot gate by jumping, eat themselves a sheep, and clear it again, they're not going to jump up and land with their paws or their nose on those sharp things. So they would not come in, but they would jump the gate were it not quite a bit higher. So it had sort of an odd thing, like, is that truly secure? But functionally, it really was, even though the whole wall of the pen was quite a bit lower than the gate. And I, and I apologize to those of you who go, and this is interesting, why? I can't explain that. It was interesting to me. Just because it's so different than what they look like in Missouri or Ohio. There's your whole answer. So I could go back off camera now. See you all at church. <laughs> Great camera work, as always. It is interesting. I don't really know that it draws me into a deep theological meaning, but you are, in fact, correct. Historically, that's exactly how it worked. Um, all throughout the Middle East, that was, that was how it used to work. Um, even in the deserts, when, they, that when armies would go and encamp, they would use those brambles as a way to create what's called a zareba, which would be sort of like a, a makeshift fort, if you would. I always think of like a blanket fort, but it's a lot more than that and a lot more secure than that. <laughs> Interesting. Cool. Very cool. Visual. Good. Okay. Well, we're doing something. I'm not sure what we're doing, but we're doing something. What else, folks? What else comes to you about this passage? Look, I got to preach on this in about 40 minutes. I need some help. <laughs> Joyce says we're a great twosome. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. Lennon and McCartney. Carol says the taller gate is to allow the huge farm equipment to pass through. Well, I don't know that they had any combines in uh, the biblical era, but... Uh, Oh, that's good. Kelly says she's just thinking about the sheep trusting the shepherd. Yeah, there was a whole point on that, wasn't there? I mean, Jesus talks about the sheep. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. There's a lot of trust in that, isn't there? I mean, you think about it. If you're a sheep, what, are, what is it you need? Rosalie has pointed out that sheep are uh, not the brightest of animal, but there's some simplicity in that, isn't there? Really, if you're a sheep, you're focusing on your very basic needs. Food, water, protection. That's about it, right? And so... When someone or something provides that for you, well, you're going to gravitate toward that, right? I mean, think about when you're a child. That's kind of what you want from mom and dad. You want food, you want water, you want protection, you want, you want love. And that's kind of what the shepherd provides to the sheep. Now, somebody's probably saying, well, how does the shepherd give love to the sheep don't forget the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep the shepherd protects them and watches over them that my friends is an act of love there's a day-to-day -day quality too i think it's really important that this passage names jesus as the good shepherd which a careful reader will realize 
means there are shepherds who aren't good and who are bad. Um, and Did you say bad? <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you, it's all downhill from here, folks. <laughs> but in fact, I mean, we've all heard these other stories. I've heard this preach, that there were shepherds who would break the legs of lambs, making them dependent on the shepherd, the, sh the sheep would then be carried, the lamb would be carried around on the shoulders of the shepherd until it recovered sufficiently, but the shepherd had created a codependence. And there were, in fact, shepherds 2,000 years ago who did break legs, and there were shepherds who did not break legs, just as there are parents who burn their kids' arms with cigarette butts and parents who don't. I mean, sorry to get graphic, but this is the world we live in. And... Jesus is clearly saying the best way is to nurture true love, true respect, and then also a steadfastness of regular, steady love. And that's what really creates the deep trust and the deep devotion. And the devotion is two directions. It's from sheep to shepherd and from shepherd to sheep. If there's not true respect and mutuality there, neither is as completely... Um, informed by goodness as they might be. So, anyway, a second obvious point that Jesus says he's the good shepherd reminds us that when we're interacting with others, there are often options. We can encourage codependence, we can manipulate, or we can be honest, true, caring, listening, and create true relationship. And here endeth my second mini-sermon. <laughs> I'd love to tell you that's the last one, but we all know him. It's probably not. Last today. Well, you only have three minutes left, yeah. Bill points out, and at the conclusion, Jesus said he came so that we might have abundant life. Amen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the shepherd who cares for us isn't just caring for us for now, isn't just caring for us through wool gathering season, isn't just caring for, for us until his vacation, um, is caring for us so that we might have abundant life now and always. That's beautiful. All right, folks, time for a last word, and I will leave that to you. Somebody help us wrap this up in the next minute or two. And then it got quiet. <laughs> Maybe an extra word or two on next Sunday. I will get to that. I want to give folks an opportunity to weigh in here. Abundant life now and always. Best words to end with. I think that's reasonable and fair. Well said, Joyce. So to give you a little bit more color on next Sunday, I, at, at Mass this morning and at the coffee hour, we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what's going to happen. But just so you know what will impact our Faith Matters Forum, next Sunday we will be having two worship services. An 8 a.m. drive-in service in our parking lot. Yes, all requisite approvals have been have been received. We're working through all of the logistical and technological hurdles, but we think we have a plan to get all that done. So in deference to the heat, we will have a drive-in service at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's 8 a.m. Did I say that enough? I think it's 8 a.m. and we want to make it's sure that 8 we know it's right? 8 a.m. It's 8 a.m. The drive so the drive-in service will be in our parking lot at 8 a.m. next week. <laughs> After the drive-in service, we will do a little bit of a mini coffee hour on Facebook live stream from the parking lot. The reason I'm saying this is because that will likely bleed over into our Faith Matters time. Please be a little patient and give us that option because 
we're doing some, stop me if you've heard this before, we're doing something we've never done before as a result of the pandemic. We're gonna do our drive-in service and we don't know quite how the timing is going to go with it. So be logged in, join us for the, the coffee hour afterward, join us for Faith Matters, but give, give us a little bit of grace if Faith Matters doesn't begin till 9.05 or even 9.10, we'll try to make sure we, we blend it all the way through, okay? And then at 10 o'clock, we will have our second worship service which will be a live stream worship service from the interior of the church, just as we have been doing for lo these many weeks now, okay? So people will have two opportunities to worship. If you feel called to drive to the property and stay safely in your car, appropriately socially distant, then please take part and come and be with us. If you're not quite ready for that yet, have no fear, we're not gonna put you in a position where you have to do something that makes you uncomfortable. Join us on live stream for Faith Matters and then worship with us at 10 a.m. just like we're doing now. So, did I cover everything appropriately there? Mm -hmm. Okay, my friends. Uh, more to follow on that, both at the uh, 10 o'clock mass and uh, at the coffee hour, and I'll obviously answer any questions people might have during the coffee hour. But until then, we have much work to do because these liturgies require a little bit more planning, um, stage management, lighting, dress rehearsal, and of, and of course, really great hair. So, blessings. We will see you at uh, 10 o'clock in about a half an hour.